Welcome to Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria, where fantasy and fun come to life. Hit it, guys. If you are watching this video, it means you've been selected as Freddy's newest security guard. Hello? We're going to have so much fun together. Hello, 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 my little devil darlings. This is Penny the Angelic Spirit here, and welcome to another paranormal Penny podcast. I don't have sound effects, so I can't really do that. Anyway, um, my special guest today is none other than Hyunjin herself, even though that's not her real name, but we're gonna call her that anyway. So anyway, how are you? I'm okay. How are you? I'm good. So... Today we are just we are going to talk about our thoughts on the FNAF movie, and then maybe add add a bit of Genshin in there just to make the podcast longer because I don't know if we're gonna have enough topics about the FNAF movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's see how how was the movie to you? Like what like what's your opinion on it? Um. The movie, I thought it was really good, um, but I kind of wished that they did just to make, just maybe just a little more when it comes to like the scariness of it. I mean, they did just, they did good of what they had, but I I wish they kind of just did just a little more. Um, but the movie, the movie was really good. Um, I mean, I I thought I thought it was I been seeing like a lot of like mixed reactions and stuff of people not liking it or they did like it and stuff so it's kind of so it's kind of mixed but yeah I I liked it and I wouldn't mind uh seeing it uh again well in my opinion I have to agree with you on the little more part. They could have done just a teensy, teensy bit, a little bit more. But other than that, it was a good ass movie. Pretty, pretty scary. <laughs> like our friend, she she was pretty scared. Yeah. I mean, jeez, the animatronic screams. Holy fuck. Yeah. And that's not even the best part. The best part is y'all think the animatronics are animated? Wrong. You want to tell them what you saw? So there is so there is a YouTuber um, out there that just does FNAF content, and his name is Daco, and um, he got invited to a FNAF movie uh, set, and we were able to see uh, behind the scenes with the actual animatronics, and um, no one's in the suits or anything. Everything is all programmed and stuff. And um, they even got hugs from Chica and Bonnie and, and Freddy and stuff. And like it seemed, it, it seemed like by how they were controlling the animatronics, like they had actual emotion, which was pretty pretty cool. But yeah, so they are um, actual actual programmed uh, animatronics from what I saw in the behind the scenes. I know, right? It was like so shocking. They were real yeah. robots. Holy mm-hmm. shit! Just yeah. How, how much? How much more technology are we going to develop before? I don't even fucking know. I don't know. Seriously, it's just mind blowing how they managed to make real animatronics. Which, uh, which I'm very, very happy about. Because I mean, I. You would think that maybe they would have people in the suits and stuff like that, but they took the big extra step and make them as actual animatronics, which kind of shocked me. And actually, like, made me really happy about that. And so, yeah, I was, I was just really happy about that. Yeah, I was very shocked because I thought it was people in the suits. 
in that the endoskeleton is animated or something, but nope. They go on the extra mile. And yep. Good. Holy shit. Yeah, it was pretty scary. Mm-hmm. I, what made FNAF 1, to me, the scariest was uh, the atmosphere, mostly. Because it gives you a sense of unease, like dread, like as if you should not be there. Yeah, that 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 is true. The first is the first one is is always gonna have like a special place in in the hearts of the FNAF community because it's probably I I don't wanna I don't wanna say it's one of the best FNAF games out there, but it definitely like fits the top tier because like this or this game and stuff was actually rejected by by Kickstarter and by Steam and. And all that stuff because they thought it was just stupid and a waste of time. And Scott Cawthon basically just proved them wrong and just being like, "Well, fuck you! I'm gonna freaking uh, re so release this game and see how it goes." And it just came just a big giant popular hit. Yep. Sometimes the best vengeance that you can get is proving somebody wrong. Exactly. It's it's kind of like a little petty. Not gonna lie. <laughs> Yeah, that is kind of petty. <laughs> so, out of the uh, rating 1 to 10, what would you give the movie? Um, I would give it about an 8 out of 10. Same. So, yeah, that, that was, like, super crazy. I mean, yeah. I would be in disbelief if they decided to even make FNAF 2. Um, actually, they are planning of making more movies. From a so far, I, I, uh, I think I think so, but I might have I might have read it, but then like from 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 how they ended the movie and, and stuff like that, they because because I mean the the first movie they they tried to solely focus on the first game. And which is which is all good, all good and everything, but it kind of it kind of gave me a mixture of one and three. I'm not sure why. Probably three because they added Springtrap, which is which I'm not I'm not sure on why they had to add Springtrap into this one. I don't know. Like I think it was kind of uh, a little unnecessary in a in a way i mean don't get me wrong like the the actor did a very 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 good of portraying william afton not gonna lie yeah. but i just didn't, but i just think i just think the placement of william and stuff and all of a sudden bringing out springtrap was just i don't know it just I, it just didn't really fit the story because like he doesn't come out in fnaf 1 like if you're trying if you're trying to make the movie different and stuff, that's totally fine, but also, like, with the FNAF community, since we're both in the community, that, like, to, to me, I would think that maybe you would kind of follow along this, the first game just a little bit. I don't know. I just, I just think that me, just, just putting Springtrap in the movie was just kind of unnecessary. I don't, I, I don't know. What do you think, Penny? Well, um, it was a surprise, that's for sure, and I honestly was surprised to see that they decided to put Springtrap in so early, and besides, the Springtrap that we saw is often a lie that he's not dead, it's not his spirit haunting it yet, though it probably is now, thanks to the freaking uh, animatronic locks, whatever the fuck you call it, spring locks. The spring locks, yeah. Thanks to the Springlock failure, they betrayed that very well. I kind of yeah, they did. I kind of felt for him because I'm like, oh my gosh, I can only imagine how much pain he must be in. Oh yeah, <coughs> excuse me. Basically being crushed to death, but by yeah. Springlocks. Yeah, and crushing you, they're stabbing you and everything. Like, ooh, there's even people that made fan art of what they think happened when the spring lock failure activated and even made an animation of that brutal death. But I, I can't imagine that. That's that's one of the most painful ways to die. Right, and 
and earlier on in the movie when Chica was pr was trying to put uh frick, I can't remember her name but the, the, the little girl and she and she was gonna put the little girl in another spring lock suit and we got to see what the spring locks looked like do you remember that yeah I do remember that and I think her name was maybe Abby I think I think her name was Abby yes Abby I'm not I'm not good with names <laughs> yeah I yeah her name was definitely Abby and okay yeah I saw that and it was unbelievable Mm -hmm. Honestly, I thought the kids just wanted her to stay. I didn't think that they'd actually want to kill her and make them make her into one of them. Well, but then, but then again, from what the movie was telling us, that Afton was uh, was controlling them, and I guess he he was just putting murder or like killing people instincts to uh, the spirit of the children. And uh, they were they were thinking that Afton is like their bud bud and stuff like that until Abby proved them wrong. Yeah, that makes me wonder. Like, when you die, do you even have any memory of how you die of, of your death? Uh, That's what I uh, want to know. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, sometimes um, sometimes like in the in the paranormal stuff that I watch sometimes that, like, the, the investigator sometimes will, like, ask the spirits if you remember how you died and stuff like that. And sometimes, and a lot of times, they, they do get, like, um, simple, simple words of, like, how, of how they died, like, murdered or suicide or this or that and stuff. So, I'm not sure. I think it, I, I think it just depends of how tragic it was, maybe. Or how traumatizing it was, maybe. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, just how the hell was he even able to control them to begin with? Like, you can't control ghosts. Well, in the FNAF world, apparently you can. <laughs> I, I have... I... I honestly have no idea how it would be even possible, but... Somewhere, somewhere down the line, William Afton was able to figure out on how to control them at some point in time before the actual movie timeline and uh, was able to do it. So I, I have no clue. Well, I didn't know he had a fucking daughter. Yeah, but what's weird is that um, her name was Vanessa, right? And Vanessa, she was introduced in Security Breach. Yeah, but as, as a security so, police officer. Yeah, so, but like, that's what I also don't understand on why they added Vanessa into the movie also. Like, and also of having William Afton just all of a sudden just stabbing her and killing her out of nowhere. I thought that was unnecessary. Like, it just, it, it didn't fit. Like, any, anything to do with that, anything to do with that scene, or just Vanessa in general, it just, it, it just doesn't fit to me. That's like, that's like one of the stuff that I kind of disliked about the movie. Like, added, adding characters, like, way earlier from the timeline, when they should have been, should have been added later, like Vanessa. Like, she should have been added in, like, later on movies if they're making them. Or if you finally see William Afton in like in the third movie or something or whatever, but I I don't know. Just just a lot of stuff that they've done with the movie is is good, but also just kind of unnecessary. But that's just my opinion. Yeah, honestly, I kind of forgot her name, but I'm glad you yeah. mentioned Vanessa because yeah, that is very freaking early on. And yeah. I would be stoked and literally screaming out of joy if they were to ever plan on making Security Breach into a movie. Right? Yas, and that'd probably be very scary as well. It would be cool. <laughs> yeah, very cool, because of the neon lighting and Freddy would help, because that's yeah. how he was in the original timeline. And then maybe the sequel to that could be the Ruin DLC. Yeah. Or they'll probably add the DLC into the movie, but who knows. Yeah, 
except DLC is with a different character. It's not Gregory, and her name's Cassie. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Didn't like the ending, so I figured out how to get a different ending. The scooping ending. Which oh, really? Yeah, which I think is a better ending. And the way you can get that ending is that there's an extra camera on a couple of the monitors. You just gotta look at it and zoom out. Mm -hmm. And when you cl when you click on it, there's a door, and when you click on the door, it opens. Mm -hmm. And there's a few doors. So, you go through those doors instead of following Gregory's instructions to a scooping room, and then that takes care of the mimic. Oh, damn. But I don't know if it's actually Gregory that did betray her, because there was interference in that intercom. It could have been the mimic again. Ooh. I mean, Probably. yeah, I think it was the mimic preventing Cassie from leaving, not Gregory, because Gregory is loyal to his friends. Right. He would never betray them. <laughs> so yeah, that's why I'm thinking it's the mimic that did that. Somehow, maybe cut the cords to the elevator or something. I don't know. But mm -hmm. I really hope we'll be able to find out in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I I agree with you. That was kind of unnecessary, but other than that, it was a good movie. Like it gave a sense of dread and blah 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 blah. And how yeah. were they able to make the animatronics literally pick her up? At I don't know. I don't know. Probably something as uh, something to deal with, like how they're controlling it. Yeah. It's Probably it. But I was not expecting this freaking Hunger Games dude to be Mike Schmidt. Right? I, I I don't know what I was expecting, honestly. I thought that the FNAF movie was just a rumor at that point. Yeah. I didn't think they'd actually make it, but they did. But, yeah. That's our opinions on the FNAF uh, movie. But if you guys have something else to say about it, you can let me know in the comments and we can probably have a friendly argument or something. I don't know. But right. Any, but anyway, the next topic for today is Genshin Impact, the Sumeru storyline. So, did you ever finish that storyline? I did finish it. Um, I mean, I still have stuff to do, but I think when it comes to the main storyline, I, I, I did finish it. Okay, so you want to tell us um, what happened, and after you're done telling us what happened, you can give us your opinion. Like, like what the what the actual storyline is, or or like well, what? Well, you don't have to go beginning, beginning, beginning. Just go by what you remember. Okay. Well, so when you arrive in Sumeru. We find, um, we, we kind of just, like, don't know on where to go and stuff, and so we basically were like, okay, well, maybe we can find someone to, um, ask for directions, and then we find this random lady, and Paimon was trying to grab her attention, but she wasn't listening, and, and all that stuff, and then we follow her, and then when we follow her, then there's, like, this, like, incense and stuff that this person is using and uh the traveler and the person i'm using right now is ether so um ether starts like getting dizzy and having a headache and stuff like that and then he passes out and paimon of course is like getting worried and all that stuff and you know how paimon is Trans and and then we have this like vision and it's this like really interesting place with a big giant tree and red skies and all that stuff and you keep hearing like an eerie voice in the distance and of course I'm just like what the heck is that you know and so we get closer and closer to world um to world wow I can't speak English um <laughs> so we get closer and closer to it and then all of a sudden we start hearing world forget me and then we slip out of the dream 
and we wake up and we're in like a ra- like in, a, in a, another random location. And Paimon was basically saying like, "Oh, thank God that you're awake and stuff. You've like you've been like sleeping for I think it was like two days or something. I can't remember." But um, and then we meet uh, our our very first character, Sumeru, which is Kale. And I do absolutely adore her. I think she's really super cute, and I absolutely love her. And her personality, and her eyes are just gorgeous, and stuff like that. But anyway, so we meet Kale, and then and then we start meeting our second character, Tainari. And uh, I I think as I, I think I have like a soft spot towards Tainari because he's just like one of those people. He's just one of those people where. He kind of has like a dull personality and how he talks, but then you but you'll just always like develop some sort of soft spot for Tainari. And go ahead. So you're saying it's just impossible for you to dislike him? Yes. <laughs> like yeah. like how how can you not like Tainari? Seriously. <laughs> um. So animals. And, true. And so um. Tainari had to uh, do some patrolling and stuff, and so we we did some errands and stuff with Kale, and then um, when we're with Kale, she basically kind of just gives up a li- gives us a little rundown of what Sumeru is, and that she also gives us a little background of herself and how she is friends with Amber, and that she totally is like uh, what's the word looks up so she looks up to amber and she she just wants to be the best force watcher that they could be but um there's something that is stopping her from doing that which is her disease of elazar and that's the first time that we ever hear of this disease of elazar so elazar so go ahead and explain what you remember about it so basically elazar was created uh by forbidden knowledge and what that means is that this forbidden knowledge is basically knowledge from the gods. And if you try, if you try to like try to understand it or ha- have some sort of thing that that deals with the forbidden knowledge, you'll start like going crazy, and and you'll you'll just basically just go insane. And um. The, the scholars in the academia have have dealt with this before and stuff, but they also um, say like if a scholar or someone is crazy or he looks all he looks like he's a lunatic or whatever, they basically exile them to the desert. And so how how Elazar was created, like I said, was from a uh, forbidden knowledge from a long time ago from King uh, from uh, not from King Deshret, but for some reason King Deshret was able to get his hands on this some sort of forbidden knowledge and thought it was, it was okay and shared it with his people and his people started to get to get like nuts in their head and they also started growing scales and stuff on their skin. And that's what Elazar is. And then um, Greater Lord Ruka Devata basically used all of her power to basically seal off the forbidden knowledge from from her people. And King Deshret sacrificed himself also to help to help the people. And but because because that forbid, forbidden knowledge can have like spores and particles and stuff around in the air or <clears throat> excuse me or whatever that Elazar is still around and so that is what the disease that Kale had from what from what we find out do you remember the symptoms um the symptoms i want to say um they start well first they uh, they they develop like these scales on in their on their skin. They start like losing motion uh, in in their bodies. 
Um, and then when it gets really serious, the, they basically get so bad and so paralyzed that they can't do anything or can't move and it makes them sicker and you'll eventually die from it. Mm. And and uh, Elazar is not curable. From from what we find uh, what we find out like earlier in the story, that it's not curable, and so if you die from it, then you die from it. It doesn't matter what um, they try to to cure it; it's it'll, it'll still be there. So if you if you ever have Elazar, then basically just plan your death sentence at that point. Oh man, so okay. Yeah, I remember. It was a very serious disease. Yes, it was. And I felt very bad and very bad for Kale. I felt very bad um, for her as well. Yeah. And so, um, all, th- all three of us are chilling and stuff, and Kale makes these things called, like, pita pockets. And, um, we eat them and stuff like that, and... Uh, Something happens where Paimon was about to touch her, was uh, was about to touch Kali, and Kali started freaking the flip out and saying like, "Don't do me!" And so Paimon's just like, "Oh, I- I'm sorry, I didn't mean to." And Kali and Kali was just kind of embarrassed about it, and um, she was basically was just like, "Okay, um, we're we're done." and stuff like that I'll see you tomorrow and basically runs away so we go back in our room and then the next day um Paimon basically wanted to apologize to Kali of what happened the other day and then we find Tainari again and Tainari tells us that um the Elazar is basically kind of taking a toll on her a little bit and so she has to rest but Tainari was able to give her like some form of medicine that kind of um, calms down the disease, but it doesn't get rid of it. And and then we we go have a private conversation with Tainari, and Tainari basically tells us kind of kind of a little more about Kale, and was telling us that Kale has kind of had like a, a rough past before she came to Sumeru and was a forest watcher because um, uh, Tai... Uh, tai Nari, <laughs> Kale's parents um, heard that these guys or whatever had a cure for Elazar and basically handed Kali to them and we find out it was the Fatui. And um, while Kali was there, um, they basically tortured her. And touched her a lot and stuff and and Kali just has really bad memories of it so that's why like she doesn't let anybody touch her which is understandable it's very traumatic um and that apparently the the um the Elazar uh, disease was sustained a lot like like it was she was barely showing any symptoms when she was with the Fatui but then when she escaped and stuff like that, then the Elazar just started uh, getting worse. I honestly don't know how they were able to sustain the, uh, sustain the symptoms and have it get to a point where it's not really affecting her life. I don't know how. I honestly I honestly think it was probably the doctor's doing, but that's that character's later on. Um, yeah. So basically, so, over the years, she developed half phobia. Yeah. Which is fear of being touched. Yeah. So, um, so after that, then we helped Tainari do stuff and whatever, and um, we figure out that we're not, well, we're not affected by this aroma and stuff. That this person that we met later on. Um, we're not affected by it anymore, so we're okay, and we're able to leave, um, leave Gandarvadil. And then we find out that this person that we were seeing, her name was Hapasia. And she was basically, um, doing a lot of meditation and stuff, because 
when you're a scholar in the academia, you do these like different phases of life, and of course, like I don't remember them at all. But she was uh, she was like in a second phase or something, and basically what it is is that you do a lot of meditating and a lot of fasting and not really drinking anything, and basically just trying to connect your consciousness to what they call ermine soul. Mm. And um, ermine soul is just basically an entity or whatever that basically controls the balance of life. That's what they believe. And so when they believe that they were able to connect their consciousness to ermine soul and able to collect more knowledge, which is what the academia is, is basically people that just want to constantly just connect knowledge and just be smarter and smarter and smarter and just are just like overly obsessed with gaining knowledge. That's basically, that's basically what Sumeru is, is if of course it is the, the nation of wisdom. So, um, so we meet Hapasia, but she's like very hungry and very thirsty and stuff like that. But when we get there, we meet these little creatures and stuff. Well, not, well, it was a creature and stuff, but they put us in like some sort of a dream, like a dream stage. And we, and we go through that, and, but and then we finally get out of the dream state and then we come back to normal and Paimon is like, what the heck is wrong with you? You're, you're spacing out and stuff like that. So, uh, we talked to, we talked to Hapasia and stuff as she basically gives us more, more information about the nation and more information about Ermin soul and about the stage of life she's in and that once, once she passes this stage, then she goes to another one and a whole bunch of other stuff. So we finally travel to Sumeru City and we get these, um, we get these things called Akasha Terminals. And basically what it is, it's, it's these little machine things that are powered by the God of, God of Wisdom's Gnosis. And basically, you can, um, at, you can, oh gosh, what's that freaking word? Activate or whatever, uh, information whenever you want. But, but, um, uh, whenever, uh, whenever they were trying, whenever Ether and Paimon were trying to get information about Lesser Lord Kusanali, there's nothing about her because the academia absolutely do not care about her, which we will find out later on why. But, so... Very stupid reason, I'm just gonna say that. Yeah, I know, right? So, we basically go all around Sumeru City to try to get information on how we can meet Lesser Laura Kusanali. But, we get lucky and we find this woman, and her name was Dunyarzad. And she... she <laughs> I know, right? I guess she made such a big impact that I remember her name. <laughs> so her name was Dunyarzad. And she is a loyal follower of Lesser Lord Kusanali. And so we thought, okay, maybe since she's a follower and a believer, maybe we can find out on how to meet her. But of course, uh, Junior Zah does not know how to meet her, which was disappointing. But, and then we also meet another new character and her name is Gia. And she is basically a mercenary. And she has basically been paid by the uh, Hoyamani family, which is Dunyar Zod's family, to um, basically be Dunyar Zod's bodyguard. And Dia was basically trying to get her back to the Hoyamani family, but Dunyar Zod did not want to go back. She basically just refused. And so Dia was just like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll follow you and stuff like that. I won't take your back, take you back to your parents. But and then Junior Zan basically tells us a little story of what happened when she was a little girl. And 
basically, when Junior Zard was born, she was born with uh, Elazar. And we, fi and we find out later on, but you can kind of tell because, like, her arms and stuff were always wrapped. And so I kind of, I kind of had a feeling that she might have had some sort of Elazar when I first saw her. But, but then again, like, maybe I thought it was, like, some sort of fashion thing. I, I don't know how to explain that. But... I wonder why she wrapped she did... them up. Is it because it hurts when they're exposed? No, uh, she wrapped them up because she had scales on her arms and she didn't want anybody to see them. Oh, yeah, that's... It's, it's from, from, from what, from what I got. Because, okay, so, she basically tells us when she was a little girl, um, her family basically locked her up in her room and was never allowed her to go anywhere or experience the world or, or anything. And then, one night, a voice came to her, excuse me, and kind of just like, like, it was a very calming, soothing voice, and basically it was just giving Junior Zod hope, and for her to never, never give up, never, uh, never give up on, on life or basically anything on that point. So... So Junior Zara basically believes that that voice was Lesser Lord Kusanali, and that Lesser Lord Kusanali was basically watching over her this whole time. I believe and, it was hers as well. Mm hmm So, and then we find out um, that they're basically going to be throwing this big giant festival for Lesser Lord Kusanali's birthday. And, of course, like, they're going to be needing a lot of funding and all that stuff. But a whole lot of people that are um, followers of Lesser Lord Kusanali are all coming together to throw a festival that's supposed to happen every year uh, to celebrate Lesser Lord Kusanali's birthday. <laughs> and while we're finding this out, we meet another new character, and her name is Milu. And Milu is a very interesting character. Um... She is basically a, a performer, a performer by, by trade, and uh, she was going to do um, a dance that basically that the goddess of flowers um, did for Greater Lord Ruka Devata on her birthday, like hundreds of years ago, and stuff. So basically, we. We go, we go into this like little, uh, little hotel room and stuff. And then, uh, Junior Zod was saying like that she's so excited and stuff like that. And that she, that she can't wait for this and stuff like that. And she thought that she won't sleep and, and all that stuff. And so we, we go, we go into our little house thing that, that we were staying in. So, and then. Um, we wake up, and, uh, we, we met Junior Zod at a, at a random location, and was like, hey, was like, hey, Junior Zod, you're, you're early, did we oversleep? And she's like, no, I was, I've been here, I woke up early, I've been here for a while. And so we check, and so we check out some of the stalls, like, the first stall we checked out was, um, having, like, a whole bunch of different kinds of fruits and stuff like that for the festival. And then we go to the alchemist um, stand and basically doing a quote unquote fortune telling, basically. Um, and then the fortune teller was basically saying, like, he sees the moon, which we're like, huh? Okay. But, and, and he had to get a book because he didn't understand it himself. But he said that, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so the moon it basically represents illusions and stuff, and like you're like like you're gonna be going through illusions or something like that. I I, I don't specifically remember what he said. Um, we go to oh shoot what was the other stall oh, oh shoot what what was he 
was doing uh, Yeah, but I'm trying to remember, like, he was... Not the Knight, Knight of Flowers? No, I don't think that was it. Varys. Yeah, but he he was a knight of something or whatever. And yeah, she does yes, like, he, he does cut out. Okay, cool. I I remembered right. So, um, we go to the stall and he hands out candy to the children and then he basically tells us um that there are boxes um everywhere and there are different kinds of flavored candies. And there is like Sensidian flavor, lavender melon. I think you said mint or something, but there's also Oni Capucho and some uh, and some other bad flavor. And so we basically had to um, pick uh, pick a candy because Paimon said, "Oh, because I want the Sensidian flavor and stuff." So we had to be lucky. And um, box number five is actually the Sensidia flavor. Just in, just in case if anybody hasn't done this quest yet and all that, I will help you right now. The Sensidia flavor is box number five. Anyway, so we grab it, we get it, and we're like, what are we get? And all that stuff. And so, um, shoot. I'm trying to remember what else we did. Oh, wait. I think I remember. Um, so event eventually, um, Junior Zod said that she needed to get something back at her place that she forgot. And so we go back to her place, but then all these air mites started showing up and basically was setting up an ambush. Oh, and hell. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then Dia comes to the rescue and, uh, basically, like, beats, beats the shit out of them or whatever while we bring... Uh, Junior Zod to a safe place and stuff. Um, and then we basically are saying like, oh, Junior Zod, are you okay? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. And stuff like that. And then Dia comes back and she's scratched up. Like, her arm is kind of scratched up a little bit. And of course, like, Junior Zod is like worried about her and all that. And she's like, ah, no, I'm okay. It's just a scratch. And Stuff, but and then we find out that the reason why that she was all scratched up is because she has a different uh, great sword than from her old one. So basically, she is getting used to this new weapon that she purchased recently. And so Junior Zod was like, "Wait, so the extra funding that we needed was because of?" And then and then Dia was like. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like type of thing. And Junior Zod was just like about to cry and all that stuff. And like Dia was like, "My lady, I I wasn't trying to make you cry." And she was like, "No, no, it's okay. It's so nice." Like you know that type of thing. So then we go to the specific bot, the specific bot, <laughs> Penny bot. <laughs> Spot. Jeez. Speak English, Jenny. My goodness. <laughs> anyway, so we go to the specific spot. <laughs> and it and deals with the bench. And we go to this bench and stuff. And then all three of us started talking and all that. And we kind of go into like in a deep conversation and stuff. And it's starting to get sunset. And then um, we're like, oh crap, we need to we need to go back to the the Samsara's festival and stuff. And Nilu was about to um, perform the dance, and Junior Zod was wanting to see that. So we go so we go back into the Samsara's festival, and then when we go in there. We see that Nilu is talking to these two people, and these two people are. are Big giant assholes, <laughs> um, and they're they're basically saying that Marza, we're gonna shut this down. You're not allowed to do this and all that. And then like Nilu's is like, but this is the Samsara's festival, and I have to like we have to do this dance for da 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 da, and and all that. But 
this dude, we find out he was the freaking Grand Sage. And basically what a Grand Sage is, is basically like the boss of bosses in the Academia. Like, he's like the most important person in the Academia. And so, so him and his assistant shut everything down, and then he says to basically say in this specific holiday to um, in, in this specific holiday we're going to put in the Akasha that um, perform, uh, performing uh, public uh, performing in public is banned and and then he basically said go ahead and worship your goddess to all your heart's desire or wh whatever the heck and so uh, so after they leave, then like Nilu is just kind of down and stuff like that. And we're like, oh my gosh, Nilu, are you okay? And stuff like that. And she's like, yeah, I'm okay. And stuff like that. And then she was basically saying, I was like, I'm, I'm sorry that I, that I wasn't able to um, perform the dance and all that. And then, um, uh, Junior Zod was just basically saying, no, no, Nilu, it's, it's totally okay. And Nilu is just like, well, was trying to figure out on what else that she could do to basically perform the dance and stuff like that, because that's all Junior Zod wanted. But, and then Nilu was like, well, don't worry, maybe we can do this next year and stuff like that. And then Junior Zod is like, yeah, next year. I guess, and then we all leave, and so Paimon, so Paimon and Ether basically kind of do a recap of what happened that day. Oh, and just so you guys know, Ether is one of the twins. In case you didn't know, the other twin is named name is me. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, carry on. No, you're good. So, um. We kind of we kind of do like a recap on of what happened that day and stuff like that, and then uh, then we both fall asleep. Next day, um, Paimon is basically oh, I barely slept and all that, and then she's like, "Oh shoot, we got so we got to meet Junior Zod and stuff like that," and so we go meet her, but Junior Zod is not herself at all. Um, She's basically just really sad and 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 stuff, and it makes it made me sad. <laughs> but and then we d and so we we follow we follow Junior Zod in the same direction that w that we did, and um we go we go to the fruit stand stall, and then we go to the alchemy stall again, and. While we're doing this, Ether is kind of being like, why am I getting a sense of deja vu? Like, did I, have I done this already? You know, this type of thing. And so then uh, we go to the Night of Flowers and then um, we pick box number five again. And um, this guy is like, oh, how's, is like, whoa, like, what a lucky guess. How did you know that Sensetio was box number five? Da, da, da. And Ether is kind of getting like a stronger, a stronger feeling that he's having deja vu. And so, um, then we go, so, uh, so after that, then, uh, we go through the whole, uh, ambush again, and then Dia comes to the rescue. We bring Junior Zod back to the safe spot. Then Dia comes back. She's scratched up. And then we go back to the bench. And then after that, uh, we go back to the Samsara's festival, and Nilo is getting scolded again, and all that. But while during all this time, Ether is just like, I have experienced this before. Like, what's going on? And so, uh, we, we go to bed, but when we fall asleep, we hear a beep, like a random beep, and we hear two men faintly talking and stuff. Like, we can, bar we can barely make it out, but we know it's two men talking. And so, we wake up again, 
and we basically experience all that all over again. But Junior Zod is like more down than she was the other day. So it kind of so we didn't like really see all of it again. He was basically doing jump cuts and stuff, and Ether just kept feeling that he has done this stuff before. But then all of a sudden he gets these memory flashbacks and then he finally realizes that oh shoot i've experienced this before like this is not just this is not just deja vu and so ether basically told uh junior zod that we we have to well, we'll, we'll be right back and stuff and paimon is like you know that's kind of rude to leave junior zod behind like that and so, like, Ether is basically trying to make Paimon, like, understand, and, like, was asking her, have you been feeling, like, some sort of form of deja vu? And so, Paimon didn't really understand what deja vu was, but, and then she's like, oh, yeah, I know what deja vu is, like, a feeling that you experienced something before, da 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 And then she was saying, yeah, I have been feeling a, a little bit of that, but just been kind of ignoring it and stuff. And so, after so after all of that, we basically experience the whole day again, and we go to sleep. When we go to sleep, there's a, there's the there's uh, <laughs> can't talk. <laughs> um, there's this same exact beat again, and we hear two men talking, and basically, like we hear them saying that. Um, they, we need to continue on with this kind of um, project. And so <clears throat> we wake up, uh, so we wake up again and we do exactly the same thing. But what's different is that when we go to the Knight of Roses stall. Ether sees something and he looks and it, and it looks like a little girl. But she like she doesn't look like any normal like NPC girl. She looks totally different. But you see her and then she disappears. And Ether's like, what the heck? What the joke the little girl? Exactly. <laughs> so, um, we chase after her and then we run and then we run after her and stuff like that into this random location and so when we get there we we, we meet this girl but also we see junior zod in bed and we're like what the heck what is wrong with junior zod or like why is there two junior zods and like this this little this little girl is saying like Oh, you've like you've asked this question like this amount of times or or whatever, and basically during uh, during through throughout this whole thing, she was giving us hints here and there, and like having us try to f try to figure this out. And I'm not, I'm not gonna go through like all of the all of everything of how we figured it out. But eventually, we figure out that we're in a samsara. And basically, what a samsara is, is basically a dream. And someone is controlling this dream. And we have to figure out on who is controlling this dream. And once we figure out who is controlling the dream, we have to make them realize that they're dreaming. And... When you make them realize that they're dreaming, then the samsara will be broken. Because, um, in Sumeru, it's, um, <clears throat> when you're kids, you can dream all you want. But when you're adults, all of a sudden, your dreams are non-existent. But we find out that the reason why is because the Akasha. The Akasha basically uses people's dreams to basically get other people's wisdom and stuff like that. So basically, the Akasha takes away people's dreams. And that's why adults don't dream anymore. Damn. So, um, 
during a, during this whole time, like I honestly thought like this was Junior Zod's dream. And while while we are trying to figure this out, all and um, we find out that this little girl's name is Nahida. And so uh, when we think that we're finally got the puzzle down, all of a sudden Junior's Junior Zod's body is gone. I honestly thought she died. And so I got really upset. Because I'm like, why would Helioverse do that? Why? But um, Nikita basically tells us that, like, her consciousness is too weak to uh, keep, keep up with the samsara and stuff. And so um, Nikita was basically saying that she has an idea on uh, about something and that we're not going to see her until later on or whatever. So we're like, okay. But basically Nahida told us that we need to figure out who Samsara is this and we need to make them realize that they're sleeping. They're dreaming. Yeah. And so and so like we go to these we go to these different people. We go to the fruit stand, we go to the alchemist stand. Uh, we go to the Night of Flower stand, and, and and they were, and it wasn't their dream. And so, um, we basically go through the day, <clears throat> go through the day again, and we find out that this Junior Zod is basically a puppet. So it's no wonder, like she kind of has like no emotion at all, and like it was declining and stuff, like. Uh, during uh, during the story, and so so, and then we go into the Samsara's festival, and then we basically tell Nilu that just imagine, like, just close your eyes and imagine that these guys are that the Grand Sage and his assistant is not here, and so she's like, okay, and then she closes her eyes, and they disappear. So we find out that this samsara was Nilu's. Wow. And it honestly shocked me. I I would never have guessed that it was Nilu's samsara. I honestly thought this whole time this was Junior Zod's. But it wasn't. It was Nilu's. And so, since she was able to make them go away and stuff like that, she was finally able to perform the dance that she's always wanted to perform. And so we were and we were able to see it. And then everyone was able was able to see it. And then you see like a silhouette of Junior Zod watching. And excuse me, and was in complete awe. So that basically just made me completely think that Junior Zod is actually just completely freaking dead at this point. So, um, after that, then we finally are out. So we're finally out of the samsara. And then um, we find out that Junior Zod is actually okay. And that um, Nikita was actually taking over uh, Catherine's body. And then we find out that Nikita is actually Lesser Lord Kusanali. Yeah. Um, Ironic, isn't it? I know. <laughs> But after that, um, then we kind of do like m m more, more stuff and all that. Like we meet more characters like Al Haytham and um, and other people. Like I'm, tr I'm trying not to like drag this out. Um, and we also meet Sino. We meet Candace and all this stuff. And we do like a whole bunch of stuff uh, in the desert. And we also meet the Fatui Harbinger number two, the Doctor. And and then we also meet the Balladeer again. And you would think that we were done with him in, in Inazuma, but we meet him again. But we later on find out that the Academia is actually turning him into a god. And so we basically just try to figure out on how to get this, not, not have this happen. 
and we we eventually did we did uh we did confront him we and uh we had and we had Nahida with us thank goodness it was actually pretty fun to have her around and i i thought that the boss battle was was very cool um it was to me kind of hard to do because i didn't really understand at first on how to do it but once uh, the once i got used to the rhythm and everything then i got the boss battle done and we basically stopped the balladeer at that point and then um once uh once we thought that everything was completely done think again buddy <laughs> uh because the doctor freaking uh makes us um fall asleep except for nikita and the doctor <laughs> no <laughs> you're, you're good but he basically makes us fall asleep except for Nahida, and he was basically confronting Nahida at this point. And, oh my gosh, like, Nahida was the freaking best. Um, I thought that she stood her guard so freaking well, like, I honestly felt like a proud mother at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and after, and, and, before all of like the confronting with the doctor every and everything, we go to Ermansol, which is this big giant tree that we saw in the beginning of the storyline, and we got to meet the consciousness of Greater Lord Rukitabata. But she took form of, of Nahida. So we didn't really get to see her real true form. And um, basically was basically telling us on how Lesser Lord Kusanali was born and and that Greater Lord Ruka Devata really believes that Lesser Lord Kusanali is going to be a better Archon than she was and all that stuff and and basically she she said like as her la last words as the uh, the world the world forget me and so <clears throat> And so the only way for us to heal Ermansoul was to basically purge the, the sickness, the forbidden knowledge, which was Greater Lord Rukitavata's consciousness, and we had to get rid of it. And so we healed Ermansoul, and Greater Lord Rukitavata is now gone. Now her consciousness is now gone, and Ermansoul is healed. So, fast forward of us confronting the doctor, um, the doctor basically said that he had some knowledge that he would like to share. And so, like, of course, like, I get suspicious of this. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> uh, I, I know, but Nikita was like, you know what? I is like, I'm the god of wisdom and stuff like that, and I am a sucker for wisdom, so yes, like, tell me and stuff. But of course, uh, but of course, like, it, uh, skips it, and, and basically, like, we don't hear their conversation. And... Maybe it's gonna be spoilers. Probably. But, and, and then after that, uh, after when we wake up and all things are good and all that, then we talk to Nahida again, her real true self. I get to meet, got to meet her in person and stuff, and she basically was telling us more about our sibling, which is Lumine. If you're Ether, or if you're, if, but if your character's Lumine, then telling about Ether. Anyway, so we find out that our twin is from Tabat. Yeah, and that's and, Adam. Exactly. I'm like, what? How in the heck is our twin from to that? I don't understand. <laughs> um, but but uh, but then like we find, uh, but then we find out like our next location is Fontaine, and basically telling us about the the next Archon, and that how Mikita's words is she has a unique personality <laughs> like oh no <laughs> um 
and like she was answering more questions for us and all that and that is basically uh, the main storyline of Sumeru. Yeah, so a lot happened. So that was so if you guys want to play Genshin Impact to where you get to the Sumeru, you really should, because Genshin Impact's a very good game. Yeah, you won't you you would not regret it. You will I think it will be extremely fun if you guys have never played it before. And, and if you like gotcha games or if you like anime period. Yeah. And we're like Otaku, so yeah. We <laughs> Yeah. So, anyway. Unfortunately, we are going to have to conclude with this. And thank you for being here. Of course. And thank you all for listening. I'm sorry to stop it here, but I have something to do. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure my sister has something to do as well. And yes, we're sisters. Get used to it. Yeah. Anyway. Love you guys, and I will see you in the next podcast, wherever the fuck that's gonna be. Bye! <laughs> Stay clean. Bye! Guys.